move it on then. Uh, so I'm Tim Marquis. I'm with Parker Hannafin uh, with the Quick Couple Division. I'm an engineering manager there. I'm with, with Daryl uh, from Meta as we're going to present a little bit more detail on uh, what Glenn kind of laid out for the, the BlindMate Quick Connects and a little bit more of the, uh, the progress that we've been making. It is a like speed dating though. You're right, uh, Don. We're going we're gonna to keep moving pretty fast. Um, so the, the focus of our group has been on the, the, the valve interoperability testing. So there, you know, there's four different manufacturers of, of valves and a few different uh, manifold manufacturers. Uh, so we need to get the system level flow and impedance uh, characterized and we're trying to, to, try to make it as, as even as possible. Uh, and through this we did a large sample size of parts. You know, a few hundred parts, we put it at each uh, individual uh, manufacturer and so we've got four different coupling manufacturers all doing uh, testing a few hundred parts through a, a full set of tests to really characterize what's going on with all of the parts. Uh, one of the things that we really found out was in the, 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 the fixtures, uh, and we'll explain a little bit more, but the, the, all the parameters of the fixtures were very important to really come into alignment on. Uh, and then we updated the, the or in planning to update the, the QC spec with all these new testing requirements uh, and, and this recommended test sequence. So the, uh, the, the teams then collaborated with creating all this raw data and the templates uh, to be able to kind of get through all these parts fairly quickly uh, and to be able to, to run through a, this long series of tests through, through all of the different permutations. So each, each uh, supplier was testing all four supplier uh, different permutations. So all the inter interchange tests were, were done and all laid out in a, in a fairly large spreadsheet that, that the group put a lot of effort into trying to trying to get all of the different configurations captured. Um, so then the, within this temp template, we had to uh, standardize all the data collection, all the methods and reporting. So we had all common parameters, all the terminology formatting so that it all brought it in directly. We could compare results to each other. Uh, and then it was easy then to kind of take that data and parse it and really understand what was going on. Um, so then it kind of minimized all the, all the, the data burden in the collection and reporting out of, of really a large data set for all the different configurations. Part of that was the fixture development. Uh, I know uh, my group and, everybody, and, and everyone else within this, within the, the whole CLA has it really put, put a lot of effort into making sure the fixtures were consistent uh, because they need to have precise, reliable data. Uh, we had to standardize on the mating speeds, on, on all the different fo uh, mate forces uh, to get all the operational conditions correct. And then we went to just a unified fixture guideline. So then this guideline will be able to, to uh, incorporate all the different test setups so we can test at all four different sites uh, and be able to, to really have some faith and confidence in the results. We do have a few pictures of the different setups. You can see that they aren't exactly constructed all 100% uh, the same way, uh, but between Meta and Parker and Safeway and Danfoss, uh, they, they all are, are able to connect at the same speeds, we're measuring the same forces in the same way, we're measuring the offsets in, uh, offsets in the same way, uh, and any kind of hose bias that's within the system uh, is all captured within each one of those. Okay. So then some of the outcomes. Uh, within, so, you know, like I said, we, we, we tested all the different configurations, uh, whether it's different offsets, different angles, uh, and then different connections between whether it's a Parker and a Safeway or, or any of the different connection uh, vendors that are out there. Um, and it, you know, it, it worked pretty well. Uh, for some of the conditions, we did have some, some forces that would spike over, over our, our threshold limits. Uh, and this is something that we really wanted to tr truly understand. Obviously, we're trying to do this at scale. We're trying to do a large number of parts uh, and we wanna make sure that uh, the part is very robust and reliable going forward. Uh, so, you know, we, we kind of analyze these high forces, where are they coming from, uh, understanding it's, it's sensitive to uh, how stiff the hose is, what, you know, how much forces the hoses might impart on the parts, uh, and that will really affect how much connection force you have. Uh, and then uh, we did a, a fair amount of work on flow and interoperability testing whether it was, you know, different, different vendors have different connection and different results with, with uh, either different connections to different vendors or different offsets and, and really trying to put some time in to understand that. So this was the first time we really did this true full-scale interoper interoperability testing across 
they are really all four designed and, and trying to get a good understanding of it. Um, at the same time, the flow impedance was, was another major area of focus. Uh, we put some significant work into understanding how much flow impedance there is because there's two halves of a coupling, um, the flow impedance of, of a socket half and a plug half for each vendor may not always be the same as you go between different vendors. And doing the connections and making sure all the way along those, they, they do line up. Uh, and as Glenn said, we're trying to take the, the larger band here, as you can kind of see with the, the, the green bars of the scatter of where we're at and trying to bring those into a narrower band of flow impedance. Uh, and whether it's a little bit of flow on the socket that we have to change or a little bit of flow on the plug that we have to change per vendor to be able to bring that all within, within a, an acceptable range to make the manifolds work. Thanks, Tim. So Tim has kind of walked us through a bunch of the testing and data gathering that we've done uh, through the current design of the Quick Connects. Um, and as he mentioned earlier, we did en encounter a couple of issues during that testing that the team wanted to go in and investigate further. Remember the key goal of these is, is reliability and repeatability for this. So we did notice during our testing, we saw some, some of those four spikes that Tim showed earlier in one of the graphs. Um, and so we also saw a little bit of binding as well in certain configurations, not all of them, but some of the more extreme cases where we have severe um, axial misalignment and angular misalignment. And so we wanted to make sure that our system could overcome those um, in the long run. So we went back and, and took a very close look at the design, uh, created free body diagrams to really dive into the details of what might be causing those forces, uh, the spikes and the forces throughout the mating sequence. So remember these are dynamic systems, right? We've got two components coming together and so those forces change depending on what stage of, uh, of mating you're actually in. Um, so we looked at these uh, free body diagrams to kind of identify where the issues might be coming from. Um, we also took a very close look at the forces in the context of those different alignment stages, right? So like I mentioned, we've got multiple stages of mating uh, and demating. And so we could go back and look at the data that Tim talked about that we collected, put together these force curves, um, and actually kind of hone in on where those force spikes were relative to the mating sequence. And then kind of the third key observation that came out of all that testing is that we realized that the, the hoses were actually um, contributing a significant amount of force to the plugs um, during that mating sequence. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that contribute to that. So one of the things we first did actually is we needed to understand what those hose forces actually are and how they were contributing to the overall sort of free body diagram, if you will. Um, <clears throat> so the group came up with a fixture. Uh, one of the vendors actually created this fixture you see here up in the top right. Um, a great fixture that allows to actually put some measurements behind that hose force that we were seeing in these different tests. So within this fixture, it's very flexible, allows us to change those axial offsets, the angular offsets, um, even adjust the position of the hose, the rotation and the bias of the hose, uh, and then test different types of hoses as well. So with all of those, we were able to take force measurements at the tip and at the, the tip of the, the barb uh, on the plug side and really quantify what those forces actually were, right? So then we take those forces, we can plug them into our free body diagrams that I mentioned on the last slide um, and really take a look at what's actually causing these binding forces and these spikes and, and uh, frictional forces that we're seeing throughout the mating sequence. So it was a great opportunity for us to work together and really put numbers to what we were seeing through testing. Um, another area that the team was uh, investigating was making adjustments to the nominal clearances and gaps between the parts as, as they were mating. And so where we're at right now is that we're, we're currently going through testing some of those concepts. So as I mentioned, uh, looking at increasing the interfaces, uh, the interface clearances between those plug and socket halves is one area that we're currently investigating. Um, working to improve the leverage uh, as we mate those plug and sockets together um, that has to do with counteracting those hose forces and the spring forces and the valves uh, during that mating cycle. And so along those lines, different uh, members within the, the CLA created quick turn prototypes to actually go out and test some of these uh, geometry changes 
that we had identified through these free body diagrams and all these different measurements on the, on the hoses. Um, so we've got multiple concepts currently uh, being tested and evaluated. Um, and so far, uh, they're looking very promising in terms of both the mating and demating forces. So you can see here in a graph on the right, um, we've got the original round two prototypes, um, which you can see kind of in this orange graph, you see some force spikes. Those, are gonna, those different spikes along the way are gonna represent different uh, portions along the, the mating and alignment sequence. Um, and, and as Tim mentioned, some of those forces are outside of the original range that the group specified uh, that we wanted to stay within. Uh, and then we see the modified, one of the modified concepts um, went through the exact same test and you can see that a lot of those forces have come down, it's more stable. We're not seeing these large spikes or binding in any of those. Um, so a lot of improvement there. Um, one thing I did want to mention in some of the different concepts that we are testing because we're adjusting gaps and tolerances between the parts. Um, we saw a little bit of spillage in one of those concepts, a little bit more than, than what we had seen in previous testing. So we're still uh, investigating the cause of that and making additional geometry tweaks, um, whether it's the, the size of the groove or the actual O-rings, um, things like that to try to address the, the leakage on those. So now let me switch gears a little bit. We've talked a bunch about the, the valves, but we've also made some changes to the IT gear uh, as well. So Glenn talked a little bit earlier about the injection mechanism uh, on the front of the, the IT gear chassis, uh, the reference chassis design that we're using. Um, so during the last round of testing, uh, we did the full system level test. Glenn showed, showed you guys some pictures of that. Um, and we found that during that test, we were getting some deformation in those injector handles in certain areas um, as we dug into the, the root cause a little bit further, we actually found out that it was an over-test condition, so we tested beyond what our spec calls for, but it did bring about a good discussion as to whether or not we had enough margin uh, on the design itself, and so the, the group ultimately decided to make some improvements to this injector handle design, uh, so there were some geometry changes around the, the, the areas that had that weakness. Um, through FEA, we've got about a 40% increase in strength in those specific areas that we saw the deformation um, and then uh, when we start testing the next round of full system level prototypes, we'll be validating those design updates in the injector handle. On the manifold side of things, um, not a whole lot of physical changes to the manifold design recently, um, but one thing we've done is standardized on, um, or used standardized tubing uh, within the industry. Uh, the idea being that it's more readily available and overall lower cost than if it was to be custom uh, tube profiles. Um, we've also had a chance to integrate the quick connect uh, valves from all the different suppliers into these manifolds, um, test them both at the integrated manifold level as well as the full rack level. Um, again, Glenn kind of touched off on that, right? So we go through this full round of shock and vibe and handling tests, uh, transportation tests make sure we're not seeing leaks anywhere throughout the, either the production process of the manifolds themselves or the assembly process where we integrate the valves or the rack level. Um, and there are some additional design uh, and process tweaks that the manifold vendors are currently uh, evaluating and this is really to make sure that those processes are, are dialed in for uh, mass production when the quantities really start to fill up. So that's, that's kind of where we're at with the blind mate liquid cooling updates. Um, I think at this point, if there's any questions on this, we have a couple of minutes before the next talk. Um, we'd invite you guys to come up to the mic. We're five minutes, so have at it. <laughs> I have a quick stupid question. It shouldn't make any difference, but did you try positive pressure and negative pressure? Uh, in terms of the Testing or, or Test. with the actual valves? The testing. So the, the flow, uh, when, when we were doing the valve testing, we did test flow in both directions, from plug to socket and from socket to plug, and that was part of our test plan. It was always positive. In it, wasn't, it was never a vacuum on the Yes, system. right, right. So, yeah. Exactly, that's what I meant. I didn't make myself clear. Okay. Yeah. So it's always positive pressure, but you, you didn't test in case you want to actually suck the liquid, so negative pressure. So if you have a leak, you have air in the liquid instead of liquid in. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, we, we, didn't, we, we didn't do the, the testing with any kind of uh, vacuum on this, but there's no reason it, it wouldn't have an issue with that as well. In theory, it should be the same. In theory, it should right. be the same. Slow direction, right? Yeah. 
What are you targeting for flow rate through a coupling and flow rate in a rack? I don't know if we can share that at this point. Okay, yeah. We're, we're not gonna share that at this point. We're working through that. All right. Yeah, yeah. I think until the designs are stabilized and we've collected all the data um, and we're ready to release the spec, we're kind of keeping that information for now. Yeah, we wanna be confident in the numbers we share. We're still in development. Uh, I was excited to uh, see all the progress on ORV3 in general. And you know, there was a presentation yesterday at noon where they talked about like, hey, it's all ready to go. You can order all these parts, everything's good. And I'm just curious, do you guys have any uh, idea when this stuff is gonna gel to where you'd be able to make a similar kind of statement? Uh, not at this point. We're still working through the R&D and troubleshooting, but we'll have more guidance down the road. Okay, thanks. Sorry. I'm relatively new to this, but uh, what, what is the power density limit uh, uh, this code play technology can handle? That's my first question. Second question is that when you pump these uh, coolant through these, all these you know, tubes and, and manifolds, what kind of pump do you have to use sort of a to, to have enough uh, flow and uh, overcome the pressure? So in terms of heat density, we're focusing more on the components and a heat load, not a necessary heat density. Uh, and if you want to reach out to John offline, uh, he's one of the leads here as well. He's handling that part of it. And then as far as the pumps, we're really just developing a certain flow rate to do this. So it, it could be any number of sources. Yeah. Right. So this is something that would ideally work with whether it's a end of row CDU or a pumping unit within the rack or even facility water coming from the data center itself. Um, these components would potentially work with all of those. Are these, are these racks are tested for seismic test, uh, for uh, zone four seismic? We are not doing any seismic evaluation on this. I guess that hasn't been done yet. Any other questions? So if you'd like to learn more uh, about all the blind mate cooling efforts, I'd invite you guys to check out the wiki pages here. There's links within the presentations, which I believe you'll be able to download from the OCP website um, at the end of the conference. And, and feel to come by and talk to us if you see us. We'll be happy to answer whatever questions you have. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.